Um, okay, so I have almost uh, no marketing in my slides, so I'll just basically take two minutes to describe uh, a little bit about the company, and then I'll jump into into my presentation. I just have a few small, simple points that I want to make. So uh, Ayasti, we are a small company uh, out of uh, Stanford. We are in Palo Alto, growing quickly, grew 5x last year. Customer base in pharmaceuticals, financial services, hospitals, oil and gas companies, and the government. Oh, OK, OK. Do I need to repeat that? Let's assume people got it. Um, OK. So I want to leave people with a very simple idea today. Um, and that sort of goes back to why we founded Ayasi, uh, where we are, and where we're going. So this is the story. Uh, around the year 2000 or so, DARPA and NSF realized that the way people were doing science had changed. They realized that people had started doing science by creating new large complex data sets. They realized that almost half a billion dollars of scientific research financing was going into the creation of data. And new science would happen when someone discovered something new from that data. Now, this was a big change because uh, as opposed to creating confirmatory data, people were creating exploratory data. And uh, we were very much, they saw that we were very much in the mode of create data first, ask questions later. And uh, they felt that people who were creating the best data sets were probably not the best people to analyze those data sets. They felt that people were drawing incomplete or incorrect conclusions from those data sets. And they started financing research efforts in fundamental mathematics. Their blue sky idea was, could you compute your way out of this problem? Is it the case that you can sort of throw data into a bunch of machines, compute on it for a long while, and automatically come up with everything that you needed to know about that data without actually having to look at it? Um, so that's, also, that's the genesis of, uh, of what we do at ASTI. And um, just to illustrate the point, if you think about the standard analytic process, if you think about how you learn new things from data, it usually starts with a person. And uh, the person is responsible for coming up with a hypothesis, or a question, or a query. And uh, you're, then a, you're then supposed to convert that query into some sort of a SQL uh, query. Maybe you have to convert it into a MapReduce program. Maybe it's a model that you write in R or something of that sort. Or you could use business intelligence software, which will convert your question or user interface actions into a query for you. You run the query against a database. You see the results back in your visualization software. And uh, maybe you were correct, maybe you were not. So the cycle keeps going on over and over again. There are two big bottlenecks in this problem, in this process. The first bottleneck is people. If you look at the search volume for the term data scientist on uh, Google, this is the way it's growing. In 2011, no one cared. In 2012, everyone wanted 10. Um, the other thing about this process is that you can't drop out of school to become a data scientist. It actually requires some technical expertise to become a data scientist. Um, so starting Facebook, totally drop out. Not starting Facebook, becoming a data scientist, stay in school. Um, if you also look at the enrollment rates for STEM majors in the US and the way they are decreasing, this picture is not looking very pretty. The second key problem is hypotheses. So maybe you're a retailer and you're trying to predict which customers will buy which products based on what they've bought in the past. Maybe you're a hospital and you're trying to predict clinical outcomes based on uh, clinical outcomes for patients in the past. In either case, a query or a hypothesis is a part of a table, right? So for example, give me the clinical outcomes for everyone under the age of 40 who had high blood pressure. That's just a simple query. It returns a sub-matrix, if you think of the table as a giant matrix. And if you then think about the total number of such sub-matrices in a matrix, it's exponential. What that means is that there are far too many questions to ask. Even in data sets that are technically small, that are not at the trillion level point, it's very easily complex enough that you can't possibly ask all the questions that you need to ask. So we thought we would like to invert the picture a little bit. 
what we've built at ASC is a system in which you start with data, and we, without discriminating on algorithms, run lots and lots of machine learning algorithms against this data automatically. Um, algorithms like dimensionality reduction, various types of clusterings, various types of regressions, uh, supervised models, unsupervised models, and so on. And we merge the results of these algorithms using technology that we developed at Stanford called topological data analysis. I will actually not go into details on that, but I'm available after the talk to discuss it if people are curious. And uh, the first time a human being enters the picture is when they, have, when they already have something to start with. So you start with answers as opposed to starting with questions. Um, and then if you have feedback, you can obviously adjust the process. So just wanted to contrast these two pictures. You start with the person in, on the left, and uh, on the right, you, when the person enters the picture, they already have something to begin with. Now, there's something very fundamental uh, to note here. Uh, this is not viable for all sorts of problems. So if you think about the value of a problem and the amount that you're willing to invest, this is very squarely in the domain of high value problem that requires a lot of computational investment because it's actually computationally wasteful. But that's actually okay for some of the biggest problems in this world. If you're trying to discover a new drug from genetic data, it's okay to waste computation. The cost of your data set is in the millions. If you're trying to figure out if you want to dig an oil well uh, based on uh, a geological data, it's okay to be wasteful in computation because you can afford to be. Um, so in terms of, I'm actually going to switch now into some tactics here. Um, in terms of what we require and what we spend our time at ASC doing, uh, there are three things that we care about. We care about algorithms. So today, we run hundreds of algorithms on data automatically. We want to push it to be in the many thousands. We care about computation. Our users should not have to worry about will the scale or not, how many compute nodes we need. That's, that's something that we take care of automatically. And we care about user experience. So oftentimes, um, when you run these algorithms, the results of these algorithms are usually not that easy to digest. So we build custom user experiences on a per industry basis, such that the end user who's using the software or who's actually utilizing it for their work on a daily basis sees the end results in, in a very consumable, easy to use form. So I just want to sort of dig in a little bit and talk about kind of the technology problems that we had to face. Um, so it turns out that there are actually pretty good solutions if you have tiny amounts of data and you can store it in memory. And there are pretty good solutions if you have lots and lots of data. The problem that we ended up facing was that we had middling amounts of data, so tens of terabytes, uh, and we had to compute a lot on those. Right? So we, had, we were running highly nonlinear algorithms on this data set. So we had to innovate on the storage layer. So even though we use Hadoop-based storage to actually store the data redundantly, we actually had to have to pull it out and we had to build a storage system that is able to replicate data across a bunch of machines so we can run these algorithms in parallel. Um, the second um, big thing that we've done here is that we had to invent um, basic algorithms to take the maximum possible efficiency out of compute cores. We use uh, as many cores as possible on standard Intel architecture, but we use GPUs, we use FI cards, we use as many types of compute that are available on a, on a piece of hardware as possible. Um, in fact, uh, compared to some of the standard machine learning toolkits, we are oftentimes you know, 20 or 30 times faster on standard algorithms. Um, and then we had to invent a standard user experience toolkit. Right? So the idea is that we want to be able to build uh, products for specific verticals with specific user experiences without having to reinvent the wheel. So the underlying platform remains constant across all verticals and across all industries, but the user experience that we deliver on an industry, on a per industry basis, is actually very customized. So we had to reduce the cost of customization there. So we, we have designed this architecture to be very flexible in adding new algorithms, adding new data sources, scaling, and building new applications efficiently. So I want to talk, uh, switch gears and talk about some learnings along our path. So this is some tactical advice. I advise a bunch of startups back in the Bay Area. And these are oftentimes the questions that people ask me. So I thought it might be useful for this audience. 
So the first, uh, the first thing that almost everyone asks me is how did we get almost half, our, half of our customers to use our cloud-based solution? And uh, to give you some insight on why this was a technically, why this was a challenging business problem for us, um, the average cost of a data set that sits in our data centers is roughly half a million dollars. So it's very, very expensive proprietary data. And uh, when we were first, when we first went after our customers, um, they would not trust three guys out of Stanford. You know, we were like, oh, we have this cool data system, it's in the cloud, it's awesome, just throw your data in, you know, unicorns. And uh, no one would agree. So uh, what we did was we basically created publicly available data sets and made them accessible to our customers. And within three days, people were uploading their own data sets. So that was sort of one trick that we used in getting large organizations to move to the cloud uh, with people who they did not yet entirely trust. Uh, the second question that almost everyone asks me is how do you build a data science organization? So we have a kick-ass data science organization. And um, the standard answer that I give everyone is you have to figure out what you need. So most of the times, if a consumer or a web-oriented company asks me this question, what they mean by data scientists, uh, by a data science organization, is usually to engineer systems that store and report on a lot of data. Um, that's a very, very distinct need. So you need people who can use things like Hadoop, things like MongoDB, React, and so on, to build data systems. You don't actually, the actual analytics on these data sets are usually relatively simple that people employ. Uh, the data science teams at Facebook and LinkedIn started out doing these things. Obviously, they've grown substantially. But the initial founding idea for these teams was to basically engineer systems that can sort of store and report on data very quickly. The second um, type of data organization, data science organization that we see, and this is actually true for mostly um, well-established large industries, is sort of a modeling organization in which people are not engineering systems as much. They are actually, they have some pretty clean data sets usually, and they're trying to create the best possible models from these data sets. So that's a very different and a distinct need. You need more statistician type people to do this, right? So you should hire out of statistics departments and so on. And the third kind of need, uh, and this is especially true for our, our organization, is we need data scientists who sort of sit at the cusp of customer interaction and research. So we have built a data science organization in which roughly half of their time is spent working with customers, and the other half of, that, uh, half of their time is spent in taking the feedback and enhancing the product to be better for all of our customers across the organization. So this is actually some pretty hardcore research that we, that we are involved in. The third key learning is uh, many times uh, when people are starting a new big data company and they ask me for advice and and they ask me for the big problems that they're going to face with customers, there are three things that I, that I tell them. There's politics. Um, so it turns out that uh, you know, people who own the data actually have a fiefdom over it. So especially in large organizations, if you're going to sell into a large company, you have to be aware of the politics that, that ensue over data. The second is bad data. In the best case, it's, there are systematic errors in data that you know, data, the, the Informatica system was misconfigured, so the data field which was supposed to be called X is now called Y. So that's a systematic error, easy to fix. In the worst of the situations, these are adversarial problems. That, oh, I don't like you, so I'll just give you bad data. So it's better to be aware of that. And the final problem is communication. Um, oftentimes, especially these days, businesses are sort of jumping up and starting data science organizations, but uh, but one of the problems is they don't actually empower people with communication. So the data scientists might actually find something really cool, but they would have usually a hard time convincing the organization to actually act on it. So building tools that allow people to better communicate is extremely valuable in this setting. So I just wanted to share a few examples of, what, uh, of some of the work that we have done with our customers. Um, so this example comes from a hospital system and before I jump into describing the example, um, the picture that you're looking at is a network in the computer science sense. It has nodes and it has edges. Every node here represents a compression of data points. So it's a compressed view of the data. Every node is a collection of data points that are similar to each other across a large number of variables. And two nodes are connected to each other if they actually share some data points. 
the coloring of these nodes can be arbitrary. You can sort of change it on the fly. Now, this is one of my favorite data sets to talk about because this actually represents um, an analytical model that an ER department employs to figure out the kind of care that they're going to deliver to a patient who walks into the ER. So it turns out that a patient walks into the ER, they're given a long questionnaire, and based on their answers on this questionnaire and some basic clinical tests, uh, the ER assigns them a score. And if the score is good, then you, know, you get to wait a little longer. On the other hand, if the score is not that great, then you know, you're sort of treated urgently. And um, so the picture on the top actually shows you, shows the, it's a picture of the patients. So every node is a group of patients. And the color of every node represents the average score that was assigned by this model. Blue is uh, good and red is bad. Um, the picture at the bottom is the same network, but it's now colored instead of by the score, by what actually happened. So, well, first of all, there are a few things to notice. The, the first thing is that the model is actually overly optimistic. Right? So the model actually thinks people are going to be okay, but in general, it turns out people are not that okay. And uh, the second uh, key problem here is that you see this region here, uh, which the model predicted would be completely fine. But it turns out that these are some of the people who had the worst possible outcomes in ER. It turns out that if you explain what happened here, and if you look at the data underlying, and the software does this for you automatically, by the way, it turns out that these are people who are too groggy to fill out the questionnaire. Right? So they had a bunch of missing data. What that tells you is that if you are actually going to develop a model for ER, you have to take that into account. That feature is an important feature that you must now take into account to construct a better model. Um, this is an example, a very similar example actually, but from a retailer this time. So this is a large retailer, and uh, they want to reduce the number of chargebacks that they get on their transactions. So as opposed to the previous network in which every node was a group of patients, in this case, every node is a group of transactions that are grouped together based on all of their hundreds of characteristics. Um, all the red regions in this network contain transactions with a high propensity for chargeback. Uh, most of it is actually pretty easy. Two minutes? Okay, got it, great. Uh, but it, the interesting thing is that we, we found a, a region of this network in which the number of chargebacks were very high, but it had no characteristics of fraud that a model could detect. So these were people who were spending way too much time on the website. They would take their time, click, and so on. And it turns out that when people build fraud models for web fraud, they actually consider most, mostly robotic fraud. You know, what happens if there's a Python script that's actually pinging my website and trying to, uh, trying to do transactions? What ended up happening in this case was that these were actually people who, who, were, actually, who, were, trying to construct, who were trying to conduct fraud. So this was a completely counterintuitive type of fraud that we were able to discover automatically that people had missed in the past. So I, I saw Matt pointing out that we had only two minutes, so I'll skip over and very happy to answer any questions. Thanks, we have time for one before we all go drink. All right, so you guys really want a good drink, right? <laughs> That's pretty clear. Thank you so much. So you're going to be here, so if yeah, anybody has a digital question, thanks, Thank you guys. You.